My name is Adam Finn. I'm Professor of Paediatrics in Bristol, a uh, long time collaborator with the Oxford Vaccine Group, and um, very pleased and happy to have been invited to speak to you today about varicella vaccine. Um, and my title was When Will Varicella Vaccination Be Part of the UK Immunisation Schedule? To which there is a one word answer, and that one word is not never. <laughs> but I will give you the one word answer in my last slide at the end of the talk. Um, I, I made a comment earlier about social media. Adam H. Finn's my Twitter handle. It's taken me a while, um, but I now have over a thousand followers and I just tweet about vaccines. I do encourage all of you to consider doing this. It might seem to you that it isn't important or that you don't really like social media or that they're a bad thing, but if you all did this, all followed some of the uh, useful sources and retweeted to your peers and friends about vaccines, you can have an influence on what people think. Um, and if you are a Twitter person, then please follow me on Adam H. Finn. So I'd just like to start with this, uh, these three questions, which we'll actually end up with at the end of the talk as well. Um, and I'm going to try and answer the questions through the course of the talk with information. The first question is, is it true or false? Deaths and severe cases of varicella generally occur in people with underlying risk factors. I'll give you the evidence on that, but I'll tell you right now that the answer to that is no. We don't see that many deaths from varicella. We see a lot of complications from varicella, not many deaths. But the bad cases, including complications and deaths, are most commonly in people who are completely well. The use of varicella vaccine at low levels of coverage might increase problems, not reduce them. That's true. And I'll explain to you why. Giving varicella vaccine is a good idea, but it's a very bad idea to give it to earlier minority of people. And you saw, quite interestingly just now, the number of people making inquiries to the OBG website about varicella vaccine. There are quite a lot of people coming to our clinic in Bristol, mostly paediatricians at this point, who've seen complications of varicella, having their children immunized. I don't think we've got to the point where it's dangerous in the UK yet, but we could get there, and we've certainly seen that in Spain, where they had so many people buying the vaccine for their children, that they temporarily tried to ban it in order to avoid this problem, which I'll explain to you in a minute. They then gave that up and introduced the vaccine instead as being a better solution to the problem. Finally, universal high coverage use of varicella vaccine would make rates of zoster or shingles go up. So that's a, a question. And that question, interestingly, the question mark is getting smaller. And I'll explain what I mean by that during the course of the talk. This probably is uh, an important effect, but how important uh, is becoming clearer with the passage of time? And this is a key question which has held up introduction of the vaccine in this country. So let me just compare measles with varicella. So some of the, pro you've heard about measles today, some of the pro-vaccine arguments for measles vaccine is that it's a serious illness with sequelae, causes death, causes severe secondary infections. A lot of children who've had measles then get other infections and die. It's common or used to be common in, or even universal. My People of my age, we all got measles. So a big disease burden, burden preventing. The anti-vax arguments uh, against measles include that it's uh, notionally a mild illness, that there are few deaths, it's a kind of rite de passage of childhood that infection in some weird way strengthens your immunity, which is, it really does not do. Um, <coughs> measles infection does the exact opposite. But these kind of arguments get paraded around. Let's look at varicella. This is a rather, rather similar slide to the last one. Opposers of vaccination say it's a serious illness. We see lots of children who come in with complications, strokes, musculoskeletal infections. It does cause some deaths secondary infections, it's a common universal, just 90% of people get chickenpox at some point in their childhood, so there's a lot of disease to be prevented. This is not anti-vax arguments, this is the current justification for no vaccine, is saying, well, it's a relatively mild illness, it's a read of passage of childhood, the children get it, that's okay, and somehow that infection strengthens your population immunity, that's this number, question number three, whether 
having varicella around in children somehow boosts immunity in adults and stops them from getting zoster. So there's a kind of weird echo there, but pointing in opposite directions. We're all saying we should be immunizing everybody against measles, but somehow we're not saying that we should be immunizing everyone against chickenpox. Is it a mild illness? Well, a friend of mine who's an ophthalmologist <coughs> talked to me recently. He's a, a, a senior academic like me, but doesn't know about vaccines. And said he was completely shocked to discover that there was a vaccine against varicella. His teenage daughter, this is not a picture of his daughter, but it's similar, had recently had this illness. She'd been really ill. She'd been covered in these spots, and she'd been left with scars all over her face. She was absolutely devastated by this. It's not trivial. She said, he'd said if he'd only known that he could have given her a vaccine and prevented this misery, he for sure would have immunized her. So even people who make good recoveries from varicella don't regard it necessarily as a trivial illness. This is a child I saw a few years ago. He had leukemia and had been sent from a uh, another country in Europe to Paris for a bone marrow transplant in advanced state. And on the train to Paris, he was exposed to varicella. He cropped the uh, virus for a period of weeks and then months. The, the infection went on and on and on. You can see the rash developing, old scarred spots, new spots coming up. He had viremia repeatedly over a period of weeks. Eventually, he went into a hepatic failure and died. Varicella is not a trivial illness if you've got an immunocompromised patient. Uh, it's a really bad illness. The other situation where varicella causes a lot of headaches is in pregnancy, both at the beginning, and as shown here, at the end of pregnancy. If you get varicella in pregnancy, you can end up with a inj seriously injured child or a child with an overwhelming illness not dissimilar to the one I just showed you in the leukemic boy. At the moment, we're in the throes of a real panic because of lack of supplies of VZIG, which is the passive antibody preparation that we offer to pregnant women when exposed against varicella, and the lack of supply. We wouldn't have that problem if there was no varicella around because pregnant women wouldn't be being exposed to it. It's a real headache. John Enders, in the 1950s, and subsequently got his Nobel Prize for working out how to culture viruses in cells. And that discovery led to an absolute avalanche of new vaccines because people could propagate viruses serially in cells. And by doing that over and over again, you can end up with a virus which is still infectious but doesn't cause serious illness. And essentially, you end up with an attenuated vaccine. And this led to the development of the measles, rubella, and mumps vaccines in the course of a few years in the 1960s. My former mentor, Stan Plotkin, invented the rubella vaccine using exactly that technique, working in Philadelphia, having done the foundation of the work in London at Great Ormond Street. Varicella vaccine was invented by a Japanese uh, doctor, Takahashi, and he took a strain from a girl called Oka, who had varicella, and managed to uh, find a way to passage, difficult virus to grow, but he managed to passage it in guinea pig cells as well as human cells. And we now know that the virus that he produced has a set of uh, mutations in it, some of which are critical for its uh, attenuation. So it makes it a weak virus that can infect you but doesn't make you sick or gives you very, very mild varicella, somewhat like uh, what we see with the measles vaccine. And that was done in the 1970s, right now in 1974. So we've had this vaccine against varicella for a very long time. <coughs> It's now available either on its own as a single vaccine or combined with the measles, mumps, rubella, so you end up with an MMRV rather than an MMR. And like MMR, um, two dose course at least three months apart gives you very reliable protection. I'll show you some data on that just now. It's a live virus vaccine, so you might be concerned about giving it to people with uh, immunocompromised, but actually experience has shown that uh, unless you're really very immunocompromised, this is not a problem. And we, we, for many years now, have been giving it to children with HIV, for example. Children with leukemia uh, were widely studied in the 1990s in the States. As long as they're in remission, they're fine. And this virus, in fact, is sensitive to acyclovir, so you've actually got an escape hatch. If you do, do give the vaccine and it starts to make the patient sick, you simply treat them with acyclovir and then they're okay. 
Uh, there are two companies producing uh, vaccines that are licensed here in the UK and across Europe, uh, and that's Merck and uh, GSK. And they both make single and combined vaccines, um, and those are the names of the vaccines. And if you give two doses of any of these vaccines, more than 99% of cases you get seroconversion. That is, you say, the child develops antibodies to varicella. And this review was done at the behest of WHO. What I'd like you to take from this table is that uh, this is one dose of the vaccine. The figures, the percentages you're seeing on the right-hand side show you that one dose of the vaccine is very effective at preventing severe varicella. You basically don't get seriously sick with chickenpox if you've had a dose of this vaccine. Further left, you can see slightly lower figures, so it doesn't reliably prevent you from getting varicella, it just reliably prevents you from getting seriously sick. If you up the, uh, to two doses, then those figures go to close 100% for all varicella. So if you immunize children with two doses, they just don't get varicella and you can wipe, wipe varicella circulation out very effectively with high coverage. The United States uh, introduced this vaccine for all children in 1996, just one dose at the time. They're not like us, they don't effectively introduce vaccines. In the UK, you introduce a vaccine on Friday, coverage is 96-7% on Monday. It's not like that in the States, and in fact it's not like that in most other countries. We have Soviet-style central planning. It's not fashionable in politics these days, but it's really good when it comes to vaccines. So their coverage went up quite slowly, and they continued to have some varicella, and they then, uh, seven or eight years after they'd introduced the vaccine, upped it to two doses, and since then they've had very effective control. I'll show you the data just now. And you can see the number of other countries are now using the vaccine routinely including countries in Europe. Germany's got a very successful program. The Spanish, as I mentioned, having attempted to ban it, decided the better plan was to introduce it, and they're using it, as are the Greeks and a number of other countries, and, and some places in Italy. In the UK, we're simply recommending that uh, non-immune healthcare workers and lab staff get it, and household contacts of immunocompromised patients, so somehow trying to protect those kids by uh, a ring of immunized people around them, which is a, uh, uh, a nice idea, but doesn't really work very reliably. This was uh, some data from the UK and uh, show, confirms what I was telling you at the beginning, that, that when we see deaths, and we don't see very many deaths, those deaths are usually in people who uh, do not have immunocompromised and wouldn't otherwise be predicted to be vulnerable. Sometimes they have chronic illnesses, children with um, cerebral palsy and so on, but not problems with their immunity. So this is uh, an illness like measles that wipes out people that you wouldn't predict, like meningitis, if you like. But we get this idea that it's a mild illness simply because most of the cases are mild. You've got as many cases of severe varicella, probably more than we have of meningitis. We're very concerned about meningitis, and it's bizarrely because there are no such things as mild meningitis cases. It's somehow the mild cases make us ignore the severe ones. These, this was a BPSU study that was done uh, by Claire Cameron, and a number of us uh, contributed um, uh, 10 years or so ago. It gives the false impression that there are really not very many serious cases, and the reason for that is for a BPSU study, you have to have a uh, relatively small number. They won't allow you to do a study which is going to accumulate thousands of cases. So we had a very tight case definition. They had to be really pretty bad cases before they were picked up. And they only picked up just over 100 cases and, and some deaths you can see spread out across the age range. And I think in a way this study, I, mean, I almost regret doing this study because it's given the false impression that then there's not very much severe varicella around because we didn't count all those kids that had come in with cellulitis and bone infections. They just didn't fall into the definition. Here's what happened if you introduce the vaccine. This is a United States data. You're seeing the number of cases in four US states in thousands. Basically, it goes down, it goes away. These are hospitalizations. You can see that most of the hospitalizations were in young children, and they've gone away. You introduce the vaccine, the disease goes away. Deaths they've gone away too. Now you can get rid of this problem. You just immunize the children, 
so you can get rid of the problem. Good evidence. So, theories about varicella vaccine and indirect effects. Matthew and I are going to have a discussion a bit later about indirect effects. Um, so I'm not going to start that argument now, but varicella vaccine has indirect effects, herd immunity. In other words, if you immunize enough people, the disease goes away, you protect the people who are not immunized, who can't be immunized, whose immunity have worn off, and so on. But low coverage could cause le uh, lead to, to an increase in severe cases. The reason for that is that if you immunize a few children and reduce the likelihood but don't eliminate transmission, then the average age of cases will go up. And the older you are when you get chickenpox, the more likely you are to get seriously ill. Adults who get chickenpox really quite commonly get really ill. They get pneumonitis and some of them die. So you really don't want to reduce young varicella cases in order to increase the number of older varicella cases. You've got to give enough vaccine to get rid of circulation altogether. <coughs> the second theory is the one that high coverage could increase loss, and I'll come back to that in a minute. These are data from North Carolina, um, which I won't go through in great detail, but what I want you to uh, take from this is that there were reductions in age groups of children who had not been immunized once the coverage of varicella vaccine one dose reached about 50%. So once you get up to about half the children being immunized, you really start to have an impact on transmission within the general population. It's a much less infectious disease than measles. Measles, you, as, as Joanna was saying earlier, you really need up in the high 90s to get sustained protection. For varicella vaccine, it's much lower than that. And that is a, a, that is a risk, actually, because it means that if you've got 30, 40, 50% coverage in the population, you're not going to get rid of it totally, but you're going to get rid of it partially, and you're going to end up with more old people or older people getting varicella what I've just said. So uh, ex exposure, of course, of pregnant women would also increase if you increase the likelihood of them being exposed at, a, at an older age. So low coverage varicella vaccine, bad idea. Not a worry for the UK because, as, as I said, when we introduce a vaccine, bingo, we get high coverage. That's what happens here. But for countries where they've got less efficient systems, this is a worry. Now, this is the, the big issue that's been exercising us all for the last 10 years. Mark Brisson and John Edmonds uh, produced this model in the early 2000s and essentially predicted that if we introduced uh, varicella vaccine uh, for children, we would induce an epidemic, a large epidemic of zoster for a period of up to 50 years. Now, zoster is no joke. It's, not, it's a serious condition. And a third of old people who get zoster, shingles, actually develop uh, uh, post-hepatic neuralgia, which is an absolutely abominable condition. It's really awful, terrible, chronic pain. So understandably enough, that raises a question. If you're really going to do that, you might be getting rid of varicella and all of the suffering and difficulties that we see that in children. But if the price you had to pay was an epidemic of zoster, it might not be well worth paying. Uh, so that has really uh, influenced people's thinking, in this country at least, about the introduction of this vaccine. The question is, is it true? Or if it is true, to what extent is it true? And actually, if you look at the data on this, it's really very conflicting. Uh, there are observational studies, for example, studies showing that pediatricians are less likely to get zoster than uh, anaesthetists or radiologists, pediatricians being in contact with children and varicella. Conversely, there are studies that show that French monks and nuns who don't have much contact with children at all don't get zoster any more than people who are not monks and nuns. So you can, you can argue it both ways. Case control studies, 27 out of 40 case control studies show some evidence of this exogenous boosting. That means 13 out of the 40 studies don't show that. Very unclear. I think it's probably fair to summarize the position right now is that we all think that there is an effect, but we are beginning to think that it's not much of an effect. It's probably quite a small effect. The boosting you get from being exposed to a child with chickenpox that protects you against getting shingles, maybe it's there, but it's not there for very long. Old people who are the people most likely to get zoster are probably not being exposed to children with chickenpox very much. 
So fine if it happens, but it just doesn't happen very much. So probably this happens, but it just doesn't happen anything like as much as was estimated by Mark and John in their model. What about in the United States? I've told you they've been using this vaccine for a long time. Well, it turns out the zoster is going up, but it was already going up before they introduced the vaccine. And it didn't start going up any faster when they started to use the vaccine. And if anything, the, the, the rate of rise of cases is not accelerating, but is actually reducing and flattening off. And these are the latest data just about to come out in, the, in, in clinical infectious diseases. What you're seeing is a rise in zoster, this is the United States, but the top two lines where there's the highest rates, that's the oldest people, if anything, flattening off. There's something suggesting a slight acceleration in that red line, which is uh, people in their 50s, not very clear in the blue line. So uh, just at the time now, a good 20 years into their program where they really ought to be seeing Mark and John's epidemic of zoster, it's not happening. It's really not clear that that's happening. Now, if that's not happening, that's real life. And real life trumps a model because they've really used the vaccine. They've, in, they've as I've shown you, they've eliminated varicella and they're looking hard and not finding this problem. So in the end, we're gonna to have to believe this sooner or later because uh, this is real life. <clears throat> the other thing that I think Andy mentioned earlier is that uh, GSK have just produced a new zoster vaccine which really, really works. And in fact, the Americans immediately introduced it and have sort of bagged the world supply for the next three years. But we're quite keen to use it in this country too. This vaccine is very interesting because it works really well in old people. Uh, as far as we can tell so far. Uh, so in a sense, even if there were this problem with zoster, with varicella vaccine, we've already got a solution to it because we can immunize older people and stop them from getting zoster. So it's a theoretical problem to which we already have a solution. So uh, I'm gonna wind up there. Uh, Deaths and severe cases of varicella generally occur in people with underlying risk factors, that's false. They generally occur in people who are otherwise completely well. If we want to stop deaths and serious cases of varicella, the only way we can do it is by preventing it with immunization. We can't, universal immunization, we can't target the people who are going to get sick. Use of varicella vaccine at low levels of coverage might increase problems, not reduce them. That's absolutely true. If we introduce this vaccine, it needs to be at high coverage, no question. Uh, but we can do that. We know how to do that in this country. Universal high coverage use of varicella vaccine would make rates of zoster and shingles go up. Well, possibly, but I think only a bit and possibly not at all, given what we're seeing in the States. I, I, and I guess that brings us to the final slide, which is the question of, um, it's not quite the final slide, but the question of, of when will we introduce the vaccine. We've got to work out a balance here. The burden of varicella, which is mostly in children, which we as pediatricians see a lot and we're very impressed by, versus the transient theoretical increased burden of zoster, mostly in adults and the elderly. At the moment, that's the way the balance is swinging. The children are, are, are getting the varicella and we're kind of putting up with that because there's real concern about that. Maybe the balance is going to swing because maybe that concern on the right is going to turn out to be either much smaller or even non-existent. The other thing that we're doing uh, across the country now is really looking properly at the burden of varicella in children. So we're doing, we started in Bristol and other sites, including Oxford, will be really looking into these cases that come into hospital and measuring the impact on the quality of life of those children and their families so that we can get a real handle on what the disease burden is to prevent. We don't have adequate data on that but that's in hand. Sins of commission, sins of omission. It feels like if you do something, that's more important than if you don't do something. And we in vaccinology are used to that. People are a bit doubtful about whether to immunize their children, and so they just don't do it, because it feels like if they do it, that would be a bad thing. And somehow not doing it doesn't feel like a bad thing, even though that's back to front. But this is a bit like that on a whole population scale. 
So let me give you an idea. Let's, let's have the idea that we've got a virus that we've got in the lab, and we can take it out and give it to the kids, and it would kill some of them, and quite a few of them would end up in hospital, and a lot of them would end up sick. But the great thing is that a lot of old people would not get sick as a result. How many is going to vote for that? I don't think it's going to get through the regulators. That's a sin of commission, right? What we're doing is a sin of omission. We've got a tool that would enable us to get rid of that virus that is killing those children and making them sick. And, uh, and we're just not doing it. And we feel okay with that. But it's actually the same thing, isn't it? So I think we should be thinking quite carefully about the ethics of this. We're quite happy to give the nasal flu vaccine that Richard was telling you about. <coughs> the cost-benefit of that is contingent on the fact that it prevents illness in the elderly. <clears throat> we're okay when it comes to immunizing kids to protect the elderly, but we are a bit hesitant to immunize children if we've got a theoretical idea that it might somehow be harmful to the elderly. As a pediatrician, I'm not very comfortable with that. This vaccine, uh, this virus has been prevent preventable for 30 years now, so when will we start to prevent it? Well, the answer, one word answer is soon. And uh, uh, I think if I retire without this vaccine coming introduced, I will retire a sad doctor. I think it's time we, it's time we got on with this. So there's, I rest my case. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat>